Okay, so we're going to talk about disaccharides and polysaccharides. And again, we're talking about this at the elementary organic and biochem level. We're not talking about it as uh, organic one students. Because the way you'll talk about this in organic one is slightly more involved than the way a elementary organic student talks about these things. So just keep that in mind. Are looking at it at a slightly different degree of difficulty in the elementary organic class than we will in organic one. So especially for you watching it online, keep that in mind. Okay, so let's review Benedict's test. We actually talked about Benedict's test when we did aldehydes and ketones, right? This is one of the things that we said we could do in the lab to tell if we had an aldehyde or if we had a ketone. So Benedict's reagent is a copper two solution, which is blue. Right, and copper two gets reduced to copper one, and that reduction allows for the oxidation of our aldehyde. But in a ketone, there's no reaction, so it's a nice, pretty uh, test. <coughs> excuse me, to distinguish aldehydes from ketones. Right, if you've got ketones, no reaction. If you've got aldehydes, bright red. Well, it's actually kind of a dark red. It looks like a rusty kind of color. Uh, precipitate forms pretty much immediately upon heating. You need to heat it. This doesn't occur at room temperature. But once you start heating it, you, you start seeing this reddish stuff forming right away. And then the whole solution will turn red. Now, a uh, sugar that gives a positive Benedict's test is called a reducing sugar. So when you hear the word reducing sugar, okay, what we're referring to is any sugar that gives us a positive Benedict test. And why is it called reducing sugar? It's because it reduces copper two, hence the name reducing sugar. Okay, so any sugar that gives us a positive Benedict's test is called a reducing sugar because it reduces copper two to copper one. And we're gonna do lab where you'll see reducing sugars. And so all of our monosaccharides and disaccharides except sucrose, will be reducing sugars, right? So this reducing sugar gets oxidized to the carboxylic acid, and the copper two gets reduced to copper one, right? So this is a test that you can do for a nice qualitative look. Uh, for instance, one of the ways you can test for glucose in urine is you can add some Benedict's reagent, heat it, right? If your sample starts turning red precipitate, you know you've got glucose in your urine. That probably be something important to know, especially if you're studying somebody with diabetes, right? So let's talk about disaccharides. Di meaning two, and saccharide refers to sugar. That's just a generic word for sugar. So a disaccharide has two sugars linked together. Okay? Now, these two disaccharides you need to know. Okay, I'm not going to make you memorize maltose. But lactose and sucrose are ones that you come into contact with very, very frequently. So that's why you need to know their composition. Okay, lactose is made of glucose and galactose. And sucrose is made of glucose and fructose. And by the way, you know the structures for glucose, galactose, and fructose already, right? You know these three, those are the ones that you're required to learn. So lactose, and sucrose are sugars that we run into every day, whether or not we realize it. Um, we run into lactose and sucrose every day. So that's why I picked those two as the ones you need to learn. And so the sugars, the two sugars, are linked together by what's called a glycosidic bond. It's a glycosidic bond and it's an ether. In terms of the functional group, it's an ether. And so this, the way we name glycosidic bonds is by the number of the carbon. Okay, we start numbering right here. Right? This is carbon one, two, three, four, five, six. Right? We've always started numbering from far right side. Yes, one, two, three, four, five, six, and one, two, three, four, five, six. So carbon one and carbon four is where the glycosidic bond is occurring. So it's called a one, four glycosidic bond. And there are two types of glycosidic bonds. There's alpha and there's beta. Okay, can you see the difference between alpha 
one four and beta one four, right? So this is called one four because carbon number one, one, two, three, four, five, six, right? That's carbon number one. One, two, three, four, right? That's carbon number four. So that's why it's called one four. And it's called alpha because it has this configuration versus this configuration, right? Beta one four looks like this. Alpha one four looks like this. So, for instance, if this were on a test, I'd say circle the glycosidic bond and state the type. So where would you circle? Right, this whole thing right here, right? Including those two carbons, right? So you'd circle right there. And is it what kind of type? Alpha, Alpha and then what numbers? One, four. Alpha one, four, right. I'm gonna show you ones that are not one, four in a minute. That's why I wanna specify. Right, this whole thing gets circled and you would say it's alpha one four. All right, so we're gonna talk about some significant disaccharides, maltose, eh, but lactose and sucrose really you see every day. All right, so maltose, I mean, unless you're eating like a lot of malted milk balls, <laughs> right, malt sugar, it's two glucoses. I mean, you, you find it in candies and all that other kind of stuff. But uh, in terms of like what you see every single day, I, that's why I pick sucrose and lactose over it. So it has a 1,4 glycosidic bond in the alpha configuration. It's a reducing sugar. Here's lactose. It has a beta 1,4 glycosidic bond. Now, I'm not gonna make you memorize which ones have alphas and which one has betas, but if I give you the structure and say circle the glycosidic bond and identify the type, that's what I expect you to be able to do. Okay, I'm not gonna make you draw it, but I could say, Okay, you hydrolyze glucose. Well, hydrolyze means you break it up, right? So if I said, okay, you hydrolyze glucose, excuse me, you hydrolyze lactose, what two sugar monosaccharides are you gonna get? You would need to know that. I could say, draw, you know, the two products of the hydrolysis of lactose in the alpha configuration or something like that. Okay, so just be prepared for something like those kinds of things. Milk, milk products, right? And um, when we talk about proteins, which is coming up, um, we're gonna use some suffixes to identify proteins. And a lot of proteins have this ASE suffix. And so if you are lactose intolerant, you don't have the protein lactase, right? A lot of proteins have ACE at the end of the word that they, are of the molecule that they deal with. Right, so lactase is a protein that metabolizes lactose. Right, so if you're lactose intolerant, that is a lacking of lactase, the protein. And just FYI, right, is intolerance the same thing as allergy? Do you know the difference? Are they the same thing? No, they're not, right? Intolerance deals with metabolism, right? You can't metabolize it, it gives you a stomach ache. Or, the diarrhea, that sort of thing. Whereas allergy, that's an immune response, right? If you have a milk allergy, your immune system reacts. Versus if you're lactose intolerant, your gut just has problems. And those might be bad, unpleasant symptoms, but it's not the same thing as an immune reaction. So just FYI. Um, and we'll talk about cellulose here in a few minutes. We can't digest it because we don't have this enzyme, cellulase. All right, sucrose, it's table sugar. Right, that's why the reason we picked it as one of the ones you need to know. It's made out of glucose and fructose. Okay, so again, if I said draw the products of the hydrolysis of sucrose in the alpha configuration, right, you would need to do that. Now, the neat thing about sucrose is it actually has an alpha beta 1 2 glycosidic bond. It's unique. Alpha beta 1 2 glycosidic bond. So what does that 1, 2 mean? It means it's forming between carbon 1 and carbon 2 as opposed to carbon 1 and carbon 4. Right? So here's what it looks like. Here's carbon 1. And remember, glucose is a six-membered ring. Fructose is a five-membered ring. Right? So 1 and then 2 because there's carbon 1 and fructose. Right? Fructose is a ketose. So 1, 2. There's carbon two, here's carbon one. So it's occurring between one and two. 
and we call it an alpha beta one two glycosidic bond. So that's one of the unique things about sucrose. <clears throat> and let's also talk about artificial sweeteners versus sugars, right? Um, how do we decide who's sweetest? We reference it to sucrose. So sucrose has a value of 100. So sucrose is right here. That's like the reference point, right? That's like pH of 7, right? That's the, the reference point. And so sugars that are sweeter than that or less sweet than that, we're erasing it off of the sweetness of sugar, um, table sugar, I should say. And so these artificial sweeteners, and look at the values of these. I mean, they're, they're crazy off the chart. And this is an experiment I used to do with my seventh graders when I taught middle school. I would give them two cans of soda, right, right, regular and diet, and I'd say, all right, I had a big fish tank. Put them in the fish tank, see what happens, right? They have the same volume. Why is one sinking and one floating, right? The diet sugar, the diet soda has the aspartame, whereas the regular soda has the sugar, right? So to get the same amount of sweetness, you need significantly less aspartame than you do sugar. So the Regular soda has a higher density because you have to add more sugar to it, right? Versus very, very small amount of aspartame. So it gives it a greater, gives it a lesser density. But these guys all have way, 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 way big values, right? So that's why you use less of them when you're trying to achieve the same amount of sweetness. And so some fun things about um, some artificial sweeteners, right? So Splenda is called sucralose. Maybe you've seen this on a label before. Splenda's the brand name, right? I should have a trademark there, because that's the brand name. But the, the molecule is actually sucralose. So what we've done is you've taken structure of sucrose, and you've yanked off two of the hydroxyl groups and replaced them with chlorines. Now, we can metabolize this, right? Because we have the proteins to do so. But we don't have a enzyme that allows us to metabolize sucralose. We don't have sucralase, right? So you just pass it straight through your system. So the idea of it being calorie free is kind of misleading because if you take both of these and you put them in a bomb calorimeter, they're both going to release energy when you combust them, right? But for us, metabolically, they're calorie free because we just can't metabolize it. Does that make sense? So technically, yes, it has it has bond energy there, just like this does. But for us as living things, we just pass it on through. And so, uh, again, that's just saying we can't retrieve it. And aspartame, it's not even a sugar. Um, it's a dipeptide. So it's made out of two amino acids. Um, it's not even a sugar at all. My kids and I were walking through the grocery store, and they were asking me about diet, drink, we were looking at like sports drinks, I think, and they wanted to get one of the diet ones, and they said, oh, what about this one? Because the color was different, you know, and I said, yeah, that's gross, you don't want that, don't taste that. I'm not a huge fan of the artificial sweeteners. <laughs> and I'm standing in the grocery store explaining to my four-year-olds about aspartame being diet peptides, and I'm like, this is way, way, way TMI, just put it back. <laughs> you don't need to know why it doesn't taste good, just put it back. And that's my personal opinion. Some people really like it, that's not my, not my flavor. But it's about 180 times sweeter, right? Because if we look here, 18,100, so that's about 180 times. So we'll talk about amino acids coming up, right? This is actually a dipeptide, it's not even sugar. So again, when we hydrolyze a disaccharide, we get our two monosaccharides back. And so, like I said, these are the two you're responsible for knowing. If I said you hydrolyze lactose, what are you going to get? Hydrolyzed sucrose, what are you going to get? And um, you know, maybe draw it, maybe give me the Fisher, maybe give me the Hayworth, right? You can draw all these because those are what we've committed to memory. So for instance, if I said, you know, this kind of thing, sucrose is composed of, maybe that's something you would need to do on a test, and draw the Fisher projections, you know, those kinds of things. So there would be the answer. Glucose and fructose, and there it is in Hayworth, and there it is in Fisher. So one of the neat things, and maybe you've talked about this in biology, have you talked about blood typing over there? Yeah. So one of the neat things about blood typing is the terminal sugar determines the blood type, right? So if you're type O, 
versus type A versus type B, right? This is a figure from your textbook. It's a real simplified kind of, you know, cartoony representation, but I think it's pretty neat. And then the compatibility of the blood groups, right? Why would we need to know this <laughs> so that we don't kill someone if we give them a transfusion, right? Um, do you know your blood type? If you never have any reason to, you wouldn't have to, right? So the only reason I know mine is because I've had surgery. Um, and then this is a neat thing. When you talk about, if you take genetics, one of the things you'll study is called population genetics. And so there are traits that are higher frequencies in certain geographic areas. And this is a figure. Um, let's see. Oops. It's not letting me. Oh. Well, I'll go around you. This is a neat little graphic. Oh, that's why it's in its own text box. It's a figure showing the population density of the different uh, blood types over the world. So this is the B blood type, and notice here in the U.S. and uh, well actually in all of North and South America and Australia it's pretty low frequency that's B blood type and then this is the O blood type wait a second this is the O blood type and then this is A B this is A and B so O is the most common blood type in the West right 90 to 100 and that's really high. I'm, I'm type blood. I'm type O blood. Look at the high frequency of O. There's O. And then this is A and B. And then there is just B. It depends on if you're O positive or if you're O negative. Right? Because if you're O positive, isn't that universal donor? No. No. Universal. Uh, o, o negative is universal donor, right? O negative is universal donor, I think. Yeah. The RH factor has to do with that last little protein on there. I'm pretty sure O negative is the universally donated one. Anybody can receive O negative. But that's a question for your biology people. But uh, I just think it's kind of neat because in this class, if we have enough time, we do talk about some genetics just because a lot of students in this class go on to take genetics. But I don't, I don't deal with that. Yeah, so the universal donor can receive O, but it doesn't factor in RH factor here. Pretty sure O negative can be received by everybody. That's a question for a biologist. <laughs> All right, let's talk about polysaccharides really quickly. So poly meaning many, right? So many sugars. And so the polysaccharides we're going to look at are your starches, your celluloses, and your glycogens. And so starch is the storage form of glucose in plants. And um, we don't store our long-term storage as starch. We store our long-term energy storage as, do you remember? Fat. <laughs> we have long-term energy storage as fat, right? Whereas a plant, plant has long-term st energy storage as a starch. I mean, there's no, like, you know, potato growing on my foot, right? If there was, that'd be really strange, right? Let's think about why animals store their long-term energy as fat versus starch. If you do analysis of starch, combustion analysis, right, versus combustion analysis of fat, you get more bang for your buck as fat, right? So you can get the heat of um, combustion of fat is a lot higher than if you do combustion of starch. It's like three point something versus seven point something. Right? So you get a lot more bang for your buck. Why would it matter to be more efficient in your fat storage if you're a plant versus you're an animal? Well, plants don't go anywhere, right? Plants don't walk around. <laughs> we do. So if we're going to have energy storage, we want it to be the most effective, right? We want to have the most efficient use. So because we're not trees, we just just throw things down in our roots or in our bark or wherever we put it, right? We walk around with ours. That's why we don't store ours as, as starch. We store our energy as fat for long term, for long term. 
All right, so starches are glucose polymers, and there are two types, amylose and amylopectin. I'm not gonna make you draw it, just so you know. All right, there's amylose. It's got this kind of helical shape. And then there's amylopectin. Right, there's amylose versus amylopectin. Not gonna make you draw it, not gonna make you memorize which one's which, just so you have an idea of what your starches look like. Right, and we'll do some lab tests for starch, um, but I'm not gonna make you draw a starch. Now cellulose is the main component of the cell wall. Right, we don't have cell walls, because we're not plants, we don't need a cell wall. We're not gonna grow 200 feet tall. We don't have the same needs as a plant, right? And so, as I mentioned earlier, we can't metabolize cellulose. Um, animals who are able to derive some use from you know, eating grass and leaves and all that stuff is because they have bacteria in the gut that are able, now uh, uh, enabling them to do that, right? We don't have cellulase, but bacteria live in cow guts do. Right, so that's why a cow can derive energy from cellulose, whereas we can't. So if, like, you eat, I don't know, like lettuce, you don't get that, it just goes... I mean, that's why, yeah, that's why eating your leafy greens helps you go to the bathroom. Yeah, because we can't metabolize the cellulose parts. Now, we can metabolize other parts from it, but the, the actual roughage, right, we can't metabolize that. And so there's the structure of cellulose. It's just the finger from your book. And then glycogen. Now this we do, we do use. This is not long-term energy storage. This is short-term energy storage. Right? So for us, a short-term storage of energy is glycogen. Right? Glycogen and insulin regulate sugar in your blood. Those two work together. So if your blood sugar is too high, insulin tells your cells, hey, take in sugar. Blood sugar is too high. Right? And if blood sugar is too low, glycogen is our short-term energy storage so that we can have more blood sugar if you need it. Right? So short-term energy storage as glucose, long-term energy storage for us because we're animals that would be fat in lipid cells, which we'll talk about later on. So we get glucose out of that. Right? So again, that's how we regulate blood sugar. And it's got a similar structure to myelopectin, right? That's one of the ones we just talked about, that's a starch, but here's glycogen. And so the branches are a little bit longer in a myelopectin versus glycogen. So that's all we're gonna deal with in terms of disaccharides and monosaccharides in elementary organic. Uh, any questions for me before we stop? No, actually, yeah. Okay. We're talking about like the artificial sweeteners versus like sugar. Uh-huh. Why is artificial sweetener bad for you if it just goes straight through you? Well, there's debate on how much it goes straight through you. I think that's the big thing. Because we don't really know if it's being absorbed in cells and hanging out there. You know, there's debate when, on how much of it actually goes straight through. I mean, in theory, it should just all pass through your system. But because, you know, we're a complex living thing with 10 to the 15th cells, right, you can't just completely say yes it goes straight through it's not like squeezing a sponge right there's a lot of other things that could where it could be accumulating building up doing other stuff so that's one of the main reasons it's got kind of a negative perception i don't know about that one I have to read more about preventing you from losing weight maybe i mean that's the thing when you're a large mm, organism with 10 to the 15 cells you know there's just a lot of pieces moving at the same time so yeah, it's not my personal favorite, but I don't like the taste of it. That's the main reason why I don't go for it. I just don't care for the taste. But yeah, definitely um, a lot of moving parts. Anything else we want to talk about? All right, let's stop there for.